well, you have to come see it. But no, we talk about we want college students to change the world. That's, that's our goal, our, me, my goal. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, an important election. Uh, vote. We want people to vote. And we want everybody to be aware that climate change is serious business and everybody's got to participate in uh, solving the world's problems. <laughs> it's probably not as easy as it sounds. Uh, and I talk a lot about Mars, the importance of Mars in uh, our future, the planet Mars. Uh, candy bars are hard to get, but you can get them, Mars bars. Well, creationism, look, I have no problem with anybody's religion. I want to emphasize that. But the claim that the world is 6,000 or 10,000 years old, it, uh, you can show that that's not right, that it's wrong, that it's an incorrect presumption about the earth. So uh, if you want to teach that, it's okay in philosophy class or history of science and so on. But it is not an alternative to the actual science that we have discovered about the age of the Earth and the origin of stars and the elements of which, which we're made of and radioactivity and all these other extraordinary deep time, all these other extraordinary uh, uh, evidences of the true age of the Earth. And it's just you can't use tax dollars intended for science education to offer as an alternative to all that we observe in the universe, offer that as an alternative to that, that the Earth is some extraordinarily, impossibly young age. It's that question, the whole thing started, everybody. I just want to emphasize the context was about science education. It's just, the Earth is not 6,000 or 10,000 years old. It's just not. It just, so whatever it is in somebody's belief system that makes them insist on that, I encourage them to reevaluate those beliefs. And don't ask me as a taxpayer and voter to support that sort of thing. It's wrong. It's, it's demonstrably wrong. Along that line, evolution is a fact. It's something that was discovered a century and a half ago. And it's, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. We are all part of it. So to insist on teaching this other extraordinary, unverifiable, um, the term that the judge in Dover, Pennsylvania used was breathtaking inanity, if I may quote. So, uh, an idea so silly that took the judge's breath away. I mean, that's a pretty inane or silly idea. So uh, I encourage everybody, I mean, I'm not attacking anybody's religion, but those two claims are not right. The earth is more than 10,000 years old and evolution is happening right now. Uh, it is a fact of life. Well, yeah, because I, re I remind everybody, the big thing, video was done the end of May, beginning of June. It was done several months before it took off. But this is the nature of mathematics, I guess. It was exponential growth. It gets, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but then it gets bigger faster and faster, or faster and faster, if I may do it camera left to right. So uh, there's something I, I won't say I forgot about, but I didn't really give much thought to for several months because it languished on the, or was in a small area on the internet. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad that it, people are once again reevaluating this. I, the United States is extraordinary in this regard. We have a, that is, we have a large population who don't, if you will, believe on some of the fundamental ideas, fundamental discoveries made by our ancestors, by humans, by scientists. And uh, these are probably people who embrace cell phone technology. They probably all have mobile phones. They all drive cars with fuel injection. They all uh, use steel, mined maybe right here in Michigan. And they accept all that, but they don't accept these other fundamental discoveries. It must be, seriously, to, have, to hold that world view must be difficult. It's just full of contradiction for me. So uh, anyway, my point was, uh, back in uh, May or June, which I will reiterate, is that you don't want to raise a generation of science students who do not embrace these fundamental ideas. It's, 
uh, it's not in anybody's best interest. The United States will not continue to innovate, will not continue to be the world leader in technology. Other economies, other countries will outpace us if we raise a generation of people who are scientifically illiterate. So it's troubling. It's troubling. But it's also an opportunity. So it's not all bad. The most I do right now is I'm the CEO of the Planetary Society, the world's largest non-governmental space interest organization. And we do, this is the organization started by Carl Sagan, for those of you familiar with my old professor. So uh, we educate people about space science, especially what I like to call, com what Carl Sagan liked to call comparative planetology. I'm bringing that phrase back as best I can. When you compare, compare the climates of Venus and Mars to ours, you, do, you don't want to be Venus. You just know it's not for us. Uh, then uh, we educate, we create, we do all sorts of uh, what I would call uh, a niche or unusual projects. We support people who look for near-Earth objects, for asteroids. And this could be a vital thing for humankind. If you were to miss an asteroid that's coming to hit the Earth, that would be it. When I was in school, no one had an especially good theory of what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. And my uh, Mrs. McGonagall, who had been my first and second grade teacher, told us that dinosaurs, the ancient dinosaurs, had small brains. And so the mice took all their food and they died. And even she knew that that was, that's no, that was no good. But in my lifetime, people found this meteorite or uh, meteorical, uh, some large object impact off the coast of Mexico. It could have been, probably was a solid rock, but it could have been a group of rocks. It could have been some ice bearing thing. But anyway, it changed the earth, uh, for, especially for ancient dinosaurs. You don't want to do that again. That's control, alt, delete for everybody. That's it. Then the third thing the Planetary Society does, which is very important right now, is we advocate politically. We just, humankind, just landed this extraordinary rover on the planet Mars, the Curiosity rover. There is only one organization right now in the world that can do that, and that's at NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, in the US. The European Space Agency has fabulous spacecraft, which we all depend on, by the way, for getting information or data back from Mars, but they've been unsuccessful landing on Mars. The Russian and the Soviet Space Agency have not been able to land on Mars. So if we lose that capability, the, the extraordinary technical capability to do that, those people will go off and do other things. They'll write the next video game or whatever high-tech job they can find, and we'll lose that for the rest of my life for decades to come. So, the, oh, the, oh, and the other important thing about all kinds of space exploration is it raises everybody's expectation of what's possible. Uh, you guys may not be of the age where you would say, well, they can put a man on the moon, why can't they blank, whatever that thing is. It raises everybody's belief in what we can do as humans. <clears throat> and so you don't want to curtail the planetary science line item in the federal budget. So the Planetary Society is very active in petitioning congressmen, senators, the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, to maintain, and the president himself, to maintain this level of funding so that we don't lose that capability. So we educate, we create, we advocate. That's the Planetary Society. Logging is, is inherently different from mining, okay. to my point of, from my point of view. Uh, generally, I used to live in the Pacific Northwest. When you cut down a tree that's 1,500 years old, 1,200 years old, that's not a renewable resource as such. That's, that's close to uh, mining, uh, where you take material away, they'll never come back. So what we would do, and this is going to really be up to people who live around here and your generation, is to find ways to do more with less, uh, to use steel to the extent possible, and to mine it in an environmentally responsible way. You can do that. It generally just raises the cost 
at the site. But there are environmental costs beyond mining that everybody pays for, beyond the mine, I mean, that everybody pays for. So what you'd want to do one day is share that cost, have the, uh, the cost of the steel or the ore, the true cost, the carbon footprint, so-called, to be shared by everybody. And this is quite possible. You go into it saying to yourself, well, that's impossible, that'll never work, then you'll never pull it off. I've watched ads on television lately about the risk of renewable energy in this area. Well, all that's, ri everything's risky. Uh, pumping oil and oil shale or tar sand or tar shale oil sand tar, whatever the, the latest permutation of those words are, that's not environmentally uh, easy to do either. What we need, what I want you, the young people of the future to do, by the future I mean 10 years from now at, at the longest, come up with new ways to store enormous amounts of electricity. It's got to be a solvable problem. We just have to, we have to apply ourselves. And then we need distribution. We need to be able to move that electricity around uh, the developed world, North America, Europe, J Japan, and also in the developing world, in East Africa and stuff. We need to find ways to store and move enormous amounts of electricity. It's, there are a lot of reasons that it's hard, but there is no compelling reason that it can't be done. Yeah, people in college right now grew up watching the show, and it's very gratifying. I say all the time, I try to get it. I try to grasp the significance of the show, the Bill Nye the Science Guy show. But may, I don't, I'm not sure I do. I mean, these people, they recite lines from the show, stuff I said, I wrote and recited 15 years ago. It's really extraordinary, and I'm hopeful that uh, some fraction of these people will remain scientifically literate and directly address these uh, extraordinary problems that we have. We have seven billion people living on a planet with a pretty thin layer of air, and that's, that's the problem. And so what do we do about it? Well, come to the lecture. How many bow ties do you have? Uh, um, uh, what's another common question? Oh, yeah, what do you think of the singularity when computers are thought to be as sophisticated as a human brain in the next three decades? That's a common one. And, uh, and now people ask me about CNN appearances or MSNBC appearances. And I, frankly, I'll just tell you right now, I hope somebody asked me about this creationist issue. I, as I say, I did it uh, months ago, and it languished. But it's taken off, and it's, I think it's good, I'm sure it's good, because it renews this discussion. These lawsuits, school boards who want, who get certain members on school boards who want to insist on creationism, tax dollars being used to teach that the earth is 6,000 years old in science class. I mean, we fight these lawsuits all the time, but having it in a public discussion like this is very effective. Well, I've been to Detroit many, many times. I mean, I've had great time in Detroit. And uh, I don't know if you guys are into this, but people are, are saying that Detroit's going to make this huge comeback, that it's poised for this, all this infrastructure with people moving back in at low rates, low rents. And I'm excited. I think, it's, I mean, I know Upper Peninsula is not Detroit, but, and I will say one of the best co-workers I ever had on the Science Guy show was from Upper Peninsula. So that's a connection. I mean, she just had that Midwest steadiness as you all, that you pride yourselves on. She's a great worker. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. Go get them. Well, I think it's a challenge or difficulty that many of us face. My genius is unrecognized. <laughs> it's just. I mean, it's exciting. You try to convince people of your point of view. It takes a little while. No, but running a nonprofit with a bad economy, there, I've had to make, by my reckoning, I've had to make some very difficult decisions, you know, budget decisions. 
uh, personnel decisions. It's the it's the the trouble that anybody has who's in charge of an organization. The trouble, the exciting, the challenge, the opportunities. They're not problems. They're opportunities. Sure.